Um, so to kind of give you an overview of uh, what you're gonna hear from each of us, I wanna introduce all the speakers now and kind of the rough topics so you can put it in a framework as you hear all the talks. So I'm gonna talk about uh, the technical aspects of actually doing a pulmonary vein isolation procedure, which is the cornerstone of AFib ablation as it stands now, and talk about radiofrequency catheters and the other approved catheter, which is the cryo, uh, cryo balloon catheter, which we use quite a bit. Um, hopefully I won't put all of you to sleep, but it is gonna be by definition kind of more than you wanted to know about how this works. The next speaker is gonna be Dr. Natali. Andrea Natali comes to us, uh, was born in Italy and trained there, and then has uh, been at Duke and at Lexington, and then um, uh, now at, uh, weren't you? At, oh, and then at Cleveland for years, and then now is in, uh, sorry, <laughs> gotta forget. There was, there was, there was 10 years, <laughs> the 10 years we brushed by. Um, uh, and it is now, does half his work in Austin and also San Francisco and also still in Italy. And you know, I first met Andrea um, 10, over 13, 14 years ago when I hosted him for a talk and really wanted to pick his brain because he truly, with Michelle Hessiger and a couple others, was truly one of the pioneers of this field. And while I talk about pulmonary vein isolation, he's gonna talk about the fact that that's only part of the story, and in a lot of patients, that's not enough. And he's done not only pioneering work in how to ablate the pulmonary vein area, but then how to find other triggering sites that are important to ablate, which is not easy to do, um, and he's quite good at it. Um, the next speaker after that will be Dr. Marouche. Nasir Marouche uh, is from Lebanon, trained in Europe, has spent a bunch of time in Germany, then trained with uh, Dr. Natali and Cleveland Clinic, and then was recruited by one of my former mentors to the University of Utah, where he is now, and really has done cutting edge research, uh, asking the question, if I can paraphrase for you, on what role does the anatomy of the atrium play in this whole process, focusing very specifically at the role of changes in the tissue where fibrosis occurs. Fibrous tissue replaces normal tissue. And then developing a whole strategy behind how to visualize that. And then has taken it full circle, asking the question is, once we know what that anatomy is, can we guide our therapy based on it? So that's one major area that, that really he has pioneered uh, in the AFib ablation world. And then the last speaker will be Dr. Narayan. Uh, Sanjeev has done work in engineering, in neuroscience, in electrophysiology. He's been NIH funded for many years. Um, he has recently moved to Stanford, but has been you know, at many places uh, and, and travels quite a bit. Um, but he's come at this from a slightly different question uh, way. And if I can paraphrase what you've been doing, I think it would be to say that among the chaos and noise, and I'm gonna show you one of the slides of the chaos and noise of AFib, is there a way to find a window of organization among the chaos? And I think if you summarize the work he's been trying to do, it is trying to find kind of that needle in the haystack, that one area or one of several areas of, 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 of signal among the vast array of noise. And so that's another, he's launched yet another whole other area of research. And so there are varied topics. I think you'll come out of here with your head spinning. We always do in our meetings. Uh, and it also shows you what some of the cutting edge work is, but also the, it introduces the fact that there's a lot we need to learn. Um, so it'll be an exciting two hours, I hope. And hopefully we can get them all arguing with each other too, because that's when it's really, <laughs> really fun. Um, so I'm gonna start by giving kind of a, hopefully not too mundane discussion of pulmonary vein isolation. Um, so where did this all come about? Um, you know, if, if you um, uh, pull back, and And Andrea would know this well, um, you know, 15, 20 years ago, if you asked, well not 15, 20, 25 years ago, if you asked electrophysiologists would we be ablating atrial fibrillation, there are a couple crackpots in the room who'd say yes, and the rest would say there's no way in the world. Uh, and then, you know, uh, Dr. Hessiger in Europe, uh, 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 Dr. Natali and some others made some observations that, that in fact you could find single or multiple 
focus triggers that would trigger atrial fibrillation. And this is depicted in this slide. And what you're seeing is a 3D representation of the left atrium. The heart would be going back into the screen. The spine would be in front of us. And let me see if I have a um, marker. These are the pulmonary veins. These, these vessels coming in are what drain blood in from the lungs. And these were found to be hot spots. And they could have little firing uh, sites that would trigger atrial fibrillation within the atrium. So it was this novel idea now 17 years ago that atrial fibrillation may not always be atrial fibrillation. It may be pulmonary vein triggered arrhythmia. Uh, and the reason for that is if you did a cross-sectional cut through those veins, what you would see on the ridge is strips of muscle. And I'm going to show these are little muscle fibers that have very cardiac-like uh, properties that could actually fire and beat, um, which was novel at that time. And so this is now a 3D representation of the inside of the left atrium. And what you have here is the chamber. These are the pulmonary veins coming into the chamber. This is the mitral valve going into the left ventricle. And this is the left atrial appendage. So when you saw that film earlier today of the uh, watchman device occluding the left atrial appendage, it's being put there. So now if we zoom in on one of these veins, the way to depict this is that there are muscle fibers depicted in red that go in and out of the veins, and then these little cross fibers across that communicate. And in sinus rhythm, there's impulses that go out into the veins and then kind of collapse and die because there's no more tissue to, to, to react but that in some patients you can have a site on one of those muscles fire rapidly and exit the veins to trigger atrial fibrillation. And the little circular marker there is what we'd call the pulmonary vein ostium, which is a term you might hear, or, or, or the air area being called the antrum, which is our way of trying to define the border zone of where the vein ends and the atrium begins, which is not always easy to define. And we can actually measure this. We can actually visualize this in the EP lab by putting in a catheter that has multiple electrodes, anywhere between usually 8 and 20 at a time. And we can make recordings of those activations in normal rhythm and then the firing. And this is actually one of those recordings. So I'm going to walk you through this, and then you guys are all electrophysiologists after this. <laughs> so, this is a P wave. This is an electrical activation of the atrium in a normal beat. And then um, this is what we see as signal on one of those circular, what we call a lasso catheter. And that wasn't because it was uh, designed in Texas. It's just called a lasso catheter because of the shape. <laughs> and this is a normal beat. Um, and what is going on here is this induction, this uh, beginning of a chaotic activity that starts right here the first activity starts right here in the pulmonary vein, and that is pulmonary vein triggering atrial fibrillation. Uh, and when you see this, you, you know what the mechanism is. Unfortunately, we, we, we kind of rarely see this. But this is the basis behind this whole uh, process of ablating AFib through the years. Um, and so this led to uh, the idea of, well, can we prevent the entry and exit of those signals from the vein? And the first step was to say, OK, Let's see if we can ablate those fibers. So you have the catheter there, and you can record in normal rhythm the entry point into the veins by recording those fibers. And those, those markers there are electrical signals as a function of time. And what you can do is make an ablation lesion at one of those early sites. Uh, and what you'd see is that the activation, the timing of those electrical signals would change as you ablated this. This would be delayed, and now this site here, representing this fiber, was the early site at the vein, and you'd ablate the rest of those. And what you'd do is you'd get rid of all signals going in and out of the veins. You, and that's what, when you hear the term pulmonary vein isolation, that's what's being done. You're getting rid of the ability for signals, electrical signals, to go in or out of the veins. This approach was something called segmental isolation because you're doing it in segments, and it works pretty well. But um, Dr. Natali was one of the people who early on said this is not enough, um, and that, that led to someone doing 
circumferential isolation where we would do burning all the way around the vein. And the idea there was rather than kind of picking off piece by piece, you would get rid of the signals in one shot. Once you close that circle, you'd get rid of all the uh, uh, signals. And that's called pulmonary vein antral or circumferential isolation. And that also works pretty well. And that was tested in a study uh, called the Thermocool study, which was the first study that led to FDA approval of a catheter uh, for treatment of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And this, this slide depicts that study. And in this study, pa patients with paroxysmal AFib, who was coming and going on its own, who had failed an antiarrhythmic drug like flecainide or sotalol, were then randomized equally, or two to one, I think, to either a different antiarrhythmic drug or a catheter ablation using a radiofrequency catheter that heats um, and it is irrigated with saline for a variety of reasons, technical reasons we don't need to get into, but, but they're, they're important, in conjunction with a three-dimensional mapping system to help us visualize where the catheter was. Now, what you see in the next panel is the results of the trial. So this is something called a Kaplan-Meier curve. We see these all the time. Um, you should learn what these look like because as you look at data, it's important to understand. And what this is, is the freedom from having atrial fibrillation, where one is 100% and zero is 0% over time. And what it really looks at is what percentage of patients are still free of the problem over time. And it's, it's fairly sophisticated statistics. But what came out of this were two things. One, the drug therapy was abysmal. So once you failed an antiarrhythmic drug, the likelihood of a second drug working is pretty low, 16% at one year. So it's unlikely to be effective. Now, ablation was much better at 64%, meaning about 64% of people were free of atrial fibrillation predominantly. And, and it's tricky because the, in these trials, the, they're very, very regimented. 30 seconds of atrial fibrillation would be a failure, even though you might have come in with daily episodes of atrial fibrillation. So among that group that failed, the 36% that failed, there might have been people who were more than happy with the outcome. But by the technical rigors of that, um, 60, only 64% were successful. Um, so there was, ablation was much better than drug in this setting, but there was still a lot to go. There was still a lot of improvement left to go. Um, and a lot of what our three speakers are gonna be talking about is bridging that gap from the 64% on up, okay? Um, now, one of those gaps has now come out using what are called contact force sensing catheters. So when you have a catheter in the heart, we're controlling it from outside the heart, in the, uh, outside the body. These are catheters that will give you tactile feedback by telling you how hard you're pressing so if it's too hard or not hard enough. And when you use those, that success rate can go up to about the mid 70% range, realistically. Um, and so that's been a huge improvement just from this procedure alone. Um, but there are problems with trying to make a complete isolation uh, set of uh, um, uh, process by going point by point. And you can imagine, you'd rather draw a line than make a line out of dots. And this is depicted here, and that is one of the problems is if you have a gap between any one of those ablation points, that's a setup for recurrent atrial fibrillation. So one of the reasons, major reasons why people recur, other than having sites that aren't related to the pulmonary veins, is the fact that we don't always get the pulmonary veins isolated in a durable manner, okay? And the other aspect is, this is hard to do. It's technically not easy, and so while on a, on a, a picture that I depict, it looks like this. In reality, the ablation points can look like this. And if it's not complete, you can not only have re repeat AFib, but you can set up these little short circuits that are called atrial flutter. So if some of you have heard about post-ablation atrial flutter, this is one of the reasons why it occurs. So we want to make tight lesions that are compact. Um, and Dr. Um, um, uh, Marouche will talk about this in some of his work, but when you look back at patients 
who come back with recurrent atrial fibrillation or even all comers, a good percentage of those veins have reconnected. And it's not because operators are bad, it's just it's hard to do. So this was one study depicted by the pie chart that as many as a third of patients who come back for a repeat ablation, even though at the time of their initial ablation, the veins were isolated, a third of patients, none of those veins are isolated. And another third, only one is. And in fact, there was a study in Germany with non-force catheters, with the original catheters, where they took a group of patients and either purposely made gaps or tried not to make gaps in those, in those circumferential um, pulmonary vein sites, and then brought everybody back. And 70% of the patients had some degree of reconnection of their veins, with a, and, and a lot of that's associated with, with recurrent AFib. Not all, but a lot. So there's been a quest to figure out a, among the whole process of AFib, one aspect of the ways to improve this is can we get a better tool or another tool to help us get veins isolated? And that's the rationale behind balloon-based therapies, um, which we've done some work with. And the idea there is if you can use a balloon to deliver energy in one shot, or two shots, can you get a more contiguous lesion? And the only device that's thus approved thus far is a balloon that delivers cryoenergy that, that we've worked with quite a bit. There's another one still uh, in trial that uh, is used to deliver um, uh, laser energy. And there was one that did not work very well because of complications that delivered ultrasound energy in the past. Um, so cryoenergy is a little different from radiofrequency in that it freezes tissue instead of burning tissue. Um, and uh, it, because of that, it works a, a bit differently in that the catheter sticks. So once it's frozen, it, it's stuck there during the, the, the lesion, and then it, it comes loose when it stops. Um, it does less disruption of um, the underlying structure of the heart uh, when, it, when it destroys the heart cells where, where we're ablating. Um, and that can be good, but it also can have a flip side that when we use cryo as a point catheter, the recurrence rates for certain things tend to be higher than radio frequency. So um, there are some pluses and minuses um, uh, with the energy, but, but for this scenario, we, we liked what it, it has to offer. And the way this is done, rather than making point by point uh, burns around the vein, we have a catheter that has a wire. We, we put a wire in the vein, we inflate the balloon, we get contact all the way around, and then initiate a freeze lesion, and then do that again. And this is a similar kind of cat, what we call a Kaplan-Meier curve, looking at an almost identical trial using the cryo balloon instead of a point-by-point -point catheter. And again, what you see is that if you failed a, a, a drug for AFib, your likelihood of having another drug successful is very, very low. Um, um, but if you use this catheter, your success rate was about 70%. Now, is 70% different from 64%? There's no way to, to know in something like this because they're not head to head. What you know is they're at least in the, in the range, okay? We went on to look at the learning curve for this, and what we found was something really impressive was that by the time you did your 12th procedure, your success rate was quite high. Now, does this mean Everyone who's done more than 12 cryo procedures has a success rate of 90%, absolutely not. It, in the setting of a controlled setting of a trial, we saw a nice progression in the fact that you can learn how to do this well with a fairly low repeat procedure rate. So um, since then, there have been, as, as there have been new generations of radiofrequency catheters, there are new generations of the cryo balloon catheter that are stronger. And in green, what you can see is success rates around 80 plus percent for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, the, you know, the earlier phase atrial fibrillation. Um, so one thing we've been impressed with was going back to this issue of the durability of pulmonary vein isolation. Um, and um, this is, not, again, not a comparison of two trials, but I want you to focus. I presented the GAP trial with radiofrequency before. There was a recent study called SUPER looking at cryoballoon ablation uh, of paroxysmal AFib patients and then bringing everyone back to the EP lab uh, at um, three months to see who had uh, pulmonary veins still isolated. And what was really nice was only 20% of patients who had cryoballoon ablation with the new generation balloon had reconnection. And of all the veins, 91% of the veins remained isolated. So that, that's a, a, a big improvement.
Um, what we've seen is the following uh, in our experience using CryoBalloon. And this represents uh, about uh, the, the first 263 cases with the second generation balloon um, followed for over, over uh, a year, 488 days. And we ask the question, not freedom from atrial fibrillation, but freedom from the need for a redo procedure. Understanding that that's a very subjective doctor-patient discussion endpoint, but, but, but we thought it was relevant because as we look at cost of care, needing a second procedure or not is an important one. And what we found was that our repeat ablation rate was about 7%. And that when we looked at those patients, the vast majority of veins were still isolated. So that's one of the reasons why we've um, used this tool a lot for pulmonary vein isolation. Um, when you look at complications of radiofrequency versus cryoablation, they're very similar. Some weigh more than others, but um, um, they're, they're, they're similar in what can go wrong. Um, um, and we can talk about that during question and answer. And when I say um, it, it weighs differently, um, phrenic nerve injury that's transient is much more common with cryoablation than with radiofrequency, um, but it still can be there. Um, there's probably a little bit higher risk of esophageal injury with radiofrequency than cryo, but fortunately both of those are very, very low. I think most people have really diminished the damage to the pulmonary veins quite well. Um, and we've, we've been able to lower a lot of these. Um, when it comes to using blood thinners after these two approaches, they're pretty much identical, um, and you, most patients are on blood thinners after these procedures, uh, at least short, uh, for a short term. And um, the, the, the hard part is, while, while we feel the cryoballoon catheter is very good for doing pulmonary vein isolation, there's very little information on using it for other procedure, other aspects, so in patients who need additional lesions, um, when we come to the problem of, of what other catheters do you need to use, what other tools, uh, and the cost of, of care. So, so I throw this out, um, I present this to you, so you understand when your doctors say pulmonary vein isolation, what we're talking about, and the idea that there are different tools that work differently to achieve a goal. But it's not right or wrong to choose one or another. It, it fits into a framework, a bigger picture of what needs to be done with your ablation. And with that, I'm going to stop and then move to Dr. Natali, who's going to talk about other things that need to be considered in an, in an ablation. So I'll, I'll try to, uh, there is a lot of things that we're going to cover. And uh, I want to give you uh, information that are really important for you as patient because there are a lot of uh, uh, different things that you see uh, being discussed. So let's see if we can, uh, okay, I, I can see the slides over there. Okay, that's right. So, uh, first of all, um, uh, one of the critical things that make uh, uh, a good uh, AF ablation program is the volume and the experience of the operator. Uh, this is where the field still is. Certainly, some of the technology that uh, uh, Robert discussed, like the balloon technology, have helped in some way uh, in bridging that gap, but uh, still uh, experience is important in minimizing complication, achieving the best results you can um, uh, with any tool you use. Uh, and, and obviously, you know, the, the balloon is a technology that is really uh, does a good job for paroxysmal, but the moment you start having more uh, things outside the pulmonary vein, uh, you know, you, you certainly uh, have limited success with that approach. Also, you need to make sure that the center has a really a way to do the follow-up. So th th that there is a structure of people that are dedicated to that. You know, nurses usually, uh, the doctor usually are supposed to be busy in the lab. So a team of nurses that uh, work with you from the education to the follow-up, uh, but also that are involved in uh, really making sure that the follow-up is done. Um, and uh, this is an example of a follow-up that uh, uh, we've, been used for uh, uh, we've been using for many years, where uh, patients are monitored with event recorder, and then once, once they reach uh, sort of the critical uh, uh, end of the blanking period, if they are doing okay, then we establish a, a, a series of uh, prolonged uh, uh, monitoring, you know, usually seven days, uh, uh, repeated interval. Now insurance are making that difficult. And also the advent of implantable loop uh, uh, has changed. Uh, but as you, you need to make sure that there is a follow-up. Otherwise, whatever you are told is based on whatever is published, not, in the, in, not based on the local experience of the center. Uh, 
So uh, uh, Dr. Carroll already mentioned about this. Uh, when you come down to a fib ablation, there is no one procedure that works for everybody. You know, we're dealing with different patients at the different substrate, and we'll talk a little bit about everything. So certainly the procedure that you do uh, is important. Uh, we talk already about the experience of the operator, but there are a lot of sort of different situations that uh, we can uh, encounter that make everybody different. Uh, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, Robert already mentioned about this. In our group, actually, one of the things that uh, uh, Robert mentioned was uh, really the first to talk about this concept of antral isolation rather than uh, segmental osteal. Um, and uh, over the year, we have learned that, uh, yes, the pulmonary vein are important, especially in uh, the paroxysmal group, but there, there is a variety of other structure globally called the thoracic vein, which include the superior vena cava, the coronary sinus, the ligament of Marshall, and then there are others, and we'll talk a little bit about some of them because I think uh, some of them are important uh, in uh, patient uh, uh, with non paroxysmal AF. People have also talked about uh, substrate modification. Uh, as you will see, I'm not a big fan of that because that's a substrate modification means deployment of empirical lesion, which sometimes work because uh, by chance you affect an area that can be responsible for additional trigger. At least this is our, what, what, this is what our data suggests. Uh, but they, it's probably not the best approach, and now there is more data out there from a properly designed randomized study. So what, th what do we target? So let's start for paroxysma. Robert already mentioned about the pulmonary vein. One concept I want to explain to you, uh, what he already mentioned, is the idea of the antral isolation. The antral isolation was uh, considered not just because we wanted to avoid pulmonary vein stenosis, but because we had clinical data, and I'll show you two. One from a randomized study from Germany showing that antral uh, as better uh, result than osteal. But also, uh, uh, we went there for three reasons. There is a, an embryologic reason, there is an anatomical re reason. If you look at intracardiac echoes, which our group was the first to promote, you actually see very clearly that the osteal isolation really doesn't include the, the posterior extension of the vein, which we call antrum, uh, which you see there uh, outlined by the solid uh, line. Uh, we also heard about circular mapping, and other important things about pulmonary vein is the way you do it. It's not just about deploying, deploying lesion around the pulmonary vein that make an effective isolation, it's the way you do it. So what the consensus document of the expert uh, endorse is verification of isolation with circular mapping. Why is that important? So you see the ER2 procedure, that they look exactly the same. If you see the lesion deployment, it looks similar, but they're very different. In one, the one on uh, your left, uh, isolation was verified by circular mapping. In the one on the right, which is called CPVI, the lesion uh, endpoint was assessed by the same catheter that was used to deliver energy. So this is the, the procedure that uh, some, some of you may know as the Papone approach. Well. When you deploy lesion in a circular fashion without using the circular mapping cutter, uh, after the deployment of the lesion, the recording with the circular map mapping cutter can look exactly the same as you see here. So although you deploy uh, lesion in a circular fashion, the vein are not isolated. This is something that actually many of us that tried have seen uh, quite uh, frequently. This is actually a randomized study comparing the two approach, showing really dismal success a follow-up um, with uh, the CPVA approach, uh, relatively 20% uh, of arteriotomy drugs. So this is something that I want you to understand. It's not just about doing something that looks similar, it's the way you do it. So as I mentioned in our uh, lab, we always talk about antrum as uh, something that involves the posterior wall between the vein. Why is that? Uh, as I mentioned, we have clinical, we have imaging data from the eyes uh, looking at real time. We have uh, clinical data, this is actually a paper that Dr. Morush published when we were in Cleveland, showing that when you do the osteal and you challenge patient with high dose of isoproterenol, you see uh, more proximal trigger in a vast majority of the patients. And that was a sort of a clinical information that prompted, us to prompted our group to do that, uh, beside what we saw with imaging with eyes. And other things that, uh, uh, this is from another group in Taiwan showing the same concept. And other things that uh, al also we, we consider is that embryologically, the posterior wall and the pulmonary vein come from the same cluster of cell. So it means that if the pulmonary vein can fire, so can the posterior wall between the vein because the, it's the same group of cell 
that give uh, origin to that uh, structure. There is also data from the surgical literature, and I like to show this. Uh, you're going to hear uh, Dr. Damiano and Dr. Edger that they're probably the two surgeons that I um, uh, really uh, trust because they are probably uh, among the few surgeons that really uh, have done a good job in monitoring their patient. They are very honest. And so uh, Ralph feels very strongly about the posterior wall. This is some of his data. And I think some of his more recent uh, uh, follow-up still strongly support uh, this approach, which is very similar to what we've seen in our experience. Uh, uh, Rob already mentioned about this, so I'm not, I'm not gonna sort of uh, spend too much time besides saying that this, together with the balloon, is another technology that come to help maybe less experienced operator in doing a better job. In fact, in this study, when operator stay in the working force range, uh, at least 85%, 80 percent or more of the time, success rate was stable around 80 percent. Uh, so this is an important. We we also look. This is a study we did in Europe. Uh, we look at what happened to people when we prove that the antrum is isolated, and we look at two definition of antrum. What most of the people do, which is a sort of a larger circumferential versus hours. So you have this sort of the standard antrum versus hours. And we look at that our approach, let me go quickly. Our approach, this is the Kaplan-Meier curve that uh, Rob mentioned before. So the one on the top is the posterior wall. So there is, the, over time, there is a benefit by doing a more extensive antral isolation. It's not huge, but it paid off uh, after a few year follow-up. But despite that, you still see a significant number of patients, and those are all paroxysmal, that over three years have, have recurrence despite we proven that the area that we targeted was isolated with the repeat study, so those recurrence are coming from non-polmovivane triggers. So this is even in paroxysmal, and it happens some time over time. Uh, we actually, uh, again, to give you this idea, because I, 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 I think you need to know that, when we look at 10-year follow-up in patients that have been doing okay for two years, we actually have seen that uh, uh, 13, and actually now that we have wait a little longer, up to 20% of the patient uh, develop uh, recurrent uh, atrial arrhythmia, despite the pulmonary vein are isolated, uh, and the presentation can be flatter, persistent AF, or paroxysmal AF. And those are people that have done okay for between two to more than 10 years. So, um, uh, and we've seen that the most common target uh, uh, of recurrence are either the coronary sinus or the left atrial appendage. And this seems to happen more. The three risk factors in, in, in this series were female, left atrial size, and the pre existing scar. And you will hear this more and more from. And so, this is an example of one of these patients. When he came with this recurrence uh, after many, many years, his posterior wall and pulmonary vein are isolated, and he had trigger, uh, actually, it was a she from uh, the left atrial appendage. So, let me go quicker. I don't want to spend too much time. So, let's look at non paroxysmal. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we do the pulmonary vein and the posterior wall, and I, 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 I already told you why the posterior wall. Uh, uh, so, I, I'm not going to spend too much time. Embryologic reason, we have data from the surgical literature. So, what about beyond that? I, I think, we did, we, we, at least in our experience, we established that that's a must in everybody. So, what about beyond that? How, how do we go beyond that? As anybody, we look at the cafe. And actually, the CAFE early on, uh, this is a, a multicenter randomized study, shows some benefit um, uh, at, with a single procedure. Um, and, and, and a meta analysis, meta analysis are those uh, sort of post hoc analysis put, pulling together all the study with the same group of patients, sort of support that uh, in the non paroxysmal, the CAFE could have some benefit, not the same in paroxysmal. In paroxysmal, there was no benefit, but in, non, in the non paroxysmal, there was. Then uh, you heard, I'm sure, about the study F2, showing that uh, linear lesion or CAFE, very similar outcome as, uh, as the antral pulmonary vein isolation. However, you see a lot of recurrence there. So they are the same. People can argue that maybe these operators were not very experienced, that they did, not, they did not know how to deploy linear lesion or do the CAFE. But the bottom line is that uh, with all three group, uh, there was a similar outcome, but still you have, you know, Almost 50% uh, of the patients still coming back uh, if you look at the, uh, the end of that uh, survival curve. 
when we look more recently at, at, uh, at sort of this group, uh, we have seen that the cafe do have an early sort of benefit, but it's not durable. The group that actually does the best long term is the group where once we've done the posterior wall and the pulmonary vein, we really spend a lot of time going after the non-pulmonary vein triggers. And this is the group with the green line on top that uh, the long term follow up does the back. The one in the middle in red is the cafe and the one uh, at the bottom is just the posterior wall and pulmonary vein. So in the long term follow up, the only group that does better is the group where we really spend time doing it. So attention to trigger is what has become the standard in uh, our lab and all the people that work with us. And this is an example of what I mean. This is a patient that have the posterior wall and the pulmonary vein isolated. Every time he stop is antiarrhythmic. He has recurrence of a organized atrial arrhythmia that in this case was coming from a trigger at the, uh, at the red spot at the top of the roof uh, that you see there. And that was like a few more lesion to abolish that trigger and the patient has done okay. And this is the reason why I don't believe about this idea of the substrate, because substrate uh, means just empirical deployment. Uh, this is a, a patient, uh, they already have a lot of substrate modification, but because there is a trigger outside that area that was targeted, we still have recurrence. So those few extra lesions that we deployed, I don't think it make a difference in an effective substrate modification versus not. So which are the patients where we have to be more watchful about this? Severe left atrial scarring, and Nasir will talk a lot more about that. Non paroxysmal AF, female, sleep apnea and obesity, LD dysfunction, and older age. And I'll show you this uh, uh, paper that we published in Octogenarian showing that the in, even in the paroxysmal group, uh, when you reach uh, uh, eight year, and, and in female, probably sooner than that, uh, about 75, between 75 and, and 80. The prevalence of non-PP trigger in the paroxysmal group is more than 60%, which means that if you just do the pulmonary vein, you're going to have barely 40% success in that group of patients. And those are straight paroxysmal, no other risk. Obviously, when you look at the non-paroxysmal, especially the long-standing persistent, is virtually everybody. In the persistent group, we have a mix, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Where are those non-PP triggers? The most common location is the coronary sinus. The second most common in our experience is the left atrial appendage, and then interatrial septum, crista, uh, a variety of other locations. Another issue that uh, I, I think is important that our uh, community has neglected, uh, most of the people that look at non pv trigger, they go after only uh, trigger the reinitiate sustained arrhythmia. Well, we have learned that that's not enough, but especially when you use general anesthesia, uh, you need to go after uh, non pulmonary vein trigger that are non sustained. So, consistent PAC, short bursts of atrial tachycardia, and this is the data that show that. So, if you ignore those non sustained trigger, your success rate is the bottom line, is going to be very low. So, those mean something, especially if you use general anesthesia. How do we sort of make those things going crazy? Uh, people have used different things. Isoproteron high dose is the most successful, and high dose means to anti 30 mics for at least 10 minutes, maybe 15. If you do two, three minutes of five mics, it's a placebo effect. Adenosine, very rarely, sometimes. Pacing, and pacing not to induce flutter, because with pacing you can induce a lot of non clinical arrhythmia, but it's pacing to induce a fib, keep the patient in a fib, cardiovert, and then hoping that that sort of activate those trigger. Uh, so it's pacing more to induce AF, and we, we, we do that if we have no good luck with isoproteron or, or adenosine. This is an, a few examples. Most of the time, at least uh, uh, at the beginning, when you see uh, this uh, trigger firing, once you're done, we usually we do that once we're done the posterior wall and the pulmonary vein, they are most of the time rapid but organized arrhythmia. And this is why if these people have recurrence, uh, they're going to have organized arrhythmia, not just because they are GAP, but also uh, because those arrhythmia, once you have isolated the, uh, the posterior wall and the pulmonary vein, become more, they sort of sustain uh, in, an or in a more organized fashion. This is post adenosine, uh, and from the sequence of activation, this looks like something that starts from the right, up the right atrium. Um, and then another issue is that what is the endpoint? So when you find the trigger, you just ablate focally, or you have to do more. So there are a couple of sides where focal ablation doesn't work, and I'll show you which one. So one of well, certainly the superior vein camera is one of them. Uh, we have data from a randomized study that we did with a group in Italy showing that at least in paroxysmal, paid off to do 
empirical superior cab isolation. Uh, and this is to show how we do it. We use the eyes, we put the circular catheter at the lower level of the pulmonary artery, and that's a good site to isolate without affecting the sinus node. And isolation is done the same way we do it for the pulmonary vein. Um, until everything becomes silent uh, above where you put the lasso. Another side that I mentioned is the left appendage. When we look at this, uh, by just focusing early on to redo, people that have one, two procedures, they come back and the pulmonary vein are isolated. We've seen this to be the, 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 the reason for reinitiation of sustained arrhythmia in about 27% of the patient. Now we've learned that uh, uh, we have to go after, as I mentioned, also the non-sustained uh, uh, firing from the location. But when we look at sustained arrhythmia, it was 27% of people coming for redo. And what we learn is that uh, if we do focal ablation, even more than focal, ablation until the activation in the appendage is delayed, that's not enough because those people eventually come back. It can take six years, sometimes one year, but they always come back. So we learned that uh, unfortunately isolation is the best strategy. And isolation has implication in long-term ability of this continuing coumary. But, you know, if you are continuing to have arrhythmia, you're going to be on a blood thinner. So it's not trading off one problem from another. Is uh, If it's important for the patient to get rid of the arrhythmia, it doesn't matter what you need to do. We have data now from uh, a non-randomized consecutive series in long-standing persistence showing the benefit of empirical isolation of the left atrial appendage. And now we just finish uh, a randomized study called BELIEF in long-standing persistence where we randomize patient to empirical isolation of the left atrial append appendage with the first procedure versus not. And we just look at the one year follow up and we submit uh, this data. So we'll see, I think at some point we, you will see this information out in the literature. Ligament of Marshall is another potential uh, uh, target. Usually is done uh, by occluding the ligament of Marshall and then injecting ethanol. And you start from the distal component uh, to the, uh, to the pro more proximal. Um, this is a, a, an approach that was sort of uh, uh, promoted by Dr. Valderabano. We are actually now with him doing a randomized, a randomized study sponsored by NIH in persistent patient. And we'll see what the outcome. What the challenge with this approach is that uh, cannulation of the ligament of Marshall is not easy. Sometimes take uh, just another hour just to do that. And we have a significant number of patients where we could not uh, do that uh, even after struggling for a while. So, but we will see what the outcome is in, in the study. Coronary sinus, I, I mentioned this, and this is a, a typical patient that actually look like with the pulmonary vein antro had the best outcome because his atrial fibrillation stopped by doing the antro. But then when we gave the 20 mics of isoproterenol, there he goes. He goes back into a fibrillatory uh, activation with firing from CS uh, 3 and 4. You see that sort of little bits of fragmented electron is very early as this restart. And uh, this is another example of a short burst of arrhythmia from the coronary sinus. And the CS is another structure where focal ablation doesn't work well long term. Uh, I had an example that I want to show, but uh, we didn't have time. So, But this is another structure like the appendage that when you see firing, if you do focal ablation, is not going to work long term. Um, uh, and so isolation can become the best strategy, but it's not a trivial. Uh, and it can take uh, just for that, like for the appendage, uh, more than two procedure, uh, more than one procedure in almost half of the patient because of, of the way you have to deploy the lesion to avoid complication. So uh, Nasir is going to talk about this. Uh, uh, this is a, 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 a very old study showing that in patient with scar, if you just do the pulmonary vein antrum, success rate is dismal. Uh, and Nasir will talk about that. But is what does it mean? Does it mean that those patients should not be considered for ablation? No, it means that uh, pulmonary vein are not enough. Uh, and even pulmonary vein antro isolation is not enough in those patients. Uh, we actually have data from uh, this study uh, showing that uh, even in paroxysmal patients, if you take the group uh, with severe scarring and you uh, do just the standard PV antrum, this is an example of one of those patients. If you, if you just do the standard PV antrum, versus the PV antrum plus aggressive elimination on, on non pulmonary vein trigger, there is a big difference. So the group with the PV antrum only has virtually 80% recurrence of follow-up, whereas the other group uh, does a lot better. So when you see severe scarring, 
doesn't mean don't do the ablation. It means make sure that the person that is going to do your ablation is comfortable with going beyond the pulmonary vein because that's really what those patients need. And this is something that obviously, this is a group of paroxysma, but become much more prevalent uh, uh, in the non-paroxysmal patient. Uh, we also, like we did with the paroxysmal, in the persistent, uh, we look uh, at uh, uh, the benefit of doing just the PV antrum versus the non-PV trigger, and you see the difference. This is what just presented recently at the AHA meeting, the American Heart Association meeting, showing that with a single procedure, uh, going after the trigger beyond the pulmonary vein antrum in the dotted line paid off uh, in uh, 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 the long-term freedom from AF off drugs, those curve are off drugs. Uh, in the persistent group, uh, we also look at the same uh, uh, things that we, I showed you before with the paroxysma, we look at it. So what if we prove posterior wall isolation? Are these people, uh, how is the follow-up in those people? So I'll show you here, this is a, uh, the cascade, you know, people that came back, this, even if they were doing okay, they were restudied until we proven that the posterior wall was isolated versus the sort of the antral. And then we look at the follow-up of drugs, and I'll show you the couple of my, so, even when you have isolated the posterior wall, which is the top line, the success rate is better than just doing the pulmonary vein antral, leaving the posterior wall uh, intact, but you still see a significant recurrence of follow-up, almost 40%. Uh, so it means that in the, in the persistent patient, there is a group that can do okay with the, the extended antrum isolation, but there is a significant group of about 40, 45% that needs attention to the non-PV trigger. When we go in the long standing persistent, this number means uh, goes to everybody, okay? Now, uh, I think uh, Sanjeev is gonna talk about focal sources. Uh, I wanna mention a little bit ab about this. Uh, I, I think we are all excited about, you know, being able to do uh, better, especially in the non-paroxysmal patient with less ablation. And I'm not gonna spend time how this is done because Sanjeev will show you that. What I want, I want you to tell you is that, uh, yes, it's, it's good to be excited, but to, at the end, you, we still need good, solid data, which are not there yet, from multi-center randomized study to prove that this is sort of the way to go. And we have to do that uh, with different patients, so in the paroxysma and non paroxysma. The same is true for this other approach that has been developed by a company called Cardio Insight and has been tested uh, in Bordeaux, where they use a vest, the from the outside map, uh, uh, these focal sources, and then beyond doing the pulmonary vein, they, the, those uh, sites are ablated, and this is to give you an idea of the spread of this site. Also, so far, this, this approach has been tested only in consecutive patients. There is no randomized study, and without a randomized study, it's very difficult to know what that does for your patient, because you can select patients, you know, as I show you, they are persistent, they do okay with pulmonary vein antral isolation. Uh, but doesn't work for everybody. So if you don't have a randomized study where patients are allocated to different pr procedure in a random fashion, a consecutive series doesn't mean much. I wanna spend one word about this because now we see a lot of patients that after they fail one procedure or even without failing one procedure, they are, they are offered the hybrid approach. Uh, and this is an example. The hybrid approach, for the most part, try to target the posterior wall beside the pulmonary vein, which I, I, I believe is successful. But we actually, our group was the first to consider that not just everybody. You know, I don't think this should be done in paroxysma. We, did, we use it in long standing persistence, and we stopped doing this because we did not see an increased success rate. And yes, I mean, our group has a lot of experience, so it might be different in somebody else's end but also we saw a higher rate of complication. So therefore, there I don't think there is any role for a true hybrid. Doesn't mean that I don't, people should not have surgery, but do the surgery, and then if the surgery doesn't work, two, three, four months after, you go and have a catheter ablation to what, touch up whatever. The hybrid approach, which means that the same day you have both the surgery and the catheter procedure, increase the rate of complication is a logistical nightmare you are gonna be under general anesthesia for probably 10 hours or longer because you're gonna be under general for the surgical part and for the catheter-based part. So a true, I don't, I don't think there is any role for the true hybrid. There is a role for surgery, and then if the surgery doesn't work, 
months later you have uh, uh, the cutter procedure. Uh, well, I'm not going to show you this, uh, and uh, not even this. Let's go to the end, which is the summary of what I told you. Yes, the pulmonary vein are important, mostly in the paroxysmal, but as we move in the non-paroxysmal group, the presence of other sources of atrial fibrillation become more and more important, and they need to be addressed if uh, uh, success uh, 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 if you w will, if you wish to achieve high success rate uh, of antiretinic drugs. Uh, after, so this is a summary, adjunctive strategy to either PVI or PV antrum, uh, which include linear regional cafe, only have a short-term increased success uh, um, uh, in patients with non-paroxysmal AF. Isolation of the pulmonary vein, although insufficient, is important. So even if it's not all of it, uh, need to be done, but in the non-paroxysmal group especially is not the end of the story. And in that group, uh, identification of out trigger outside the antrum with high dose of isop isoproterenol is important to achieve long-term uh, cure of atrial fibrillation. The role of additional target, this is very important for you as a patient, need to be verified in properly designed study. Uh, so after all, it's important to have the right tool and the right tool is different in everybody, you know, uh, in different hands. So uh, Robert mentioned the cryo, is in, it's, a, it's a good tool for certain people as long as it's used properly. So for the paroxysmal patient, not for the non-paroxysmal. Uh, and it's also important to keep your eye on the target because it's not just about one target in many patients. Thank you very much. So you heard from uh, Andrea and uh, Rob, two major players in the field of, of AFib. Uh, when Andrea Natalia, I did my fellowship with him, was there for a while. You see how many approaches and how many, we're still trying to debate uh, what's the best way to ablate atrial fibrillation. And how many in the room here today had an AFib ablation done? Raise your hand. How many have AFib as a disease? So I would say half of you has been ablated and the rest is still waiting for Andrea's waiting list probably, <laughs> right? That's, that's, that's a status. So what I want to do um, today, I want to share with you the substrate. And obviously, one puzzle of this AFib concept we all know about is the atrial fibrosis or atrial substrate. How we use this and manage this, what we learned the last almost 10 years now in Utah since we left Cleveland. And Andrea showed you a slide, actually a very important slide. This car to map, you know what car to map, a 3D image reconstruction with the, with the scar. And we knew this for a long time when we were in Cleveland. We go to these hearts and there's so much scarring and you know, Andrea's trying to say is, is, is the triggers, is something, look for triggers though, which is true. There's something going on, we don't know yet. Sanjeev will talk about the rotors. But I wanna show this, why this concept MRI? Uh, MRI obviously is no radiation, it's easy to reproduce. It's a very great uh, instrument in detecting uh, soft tissue and that's why we focus on this. Let me see how to use this, yes. So I talk how we image the fibrotic changes in the hearts, and, and everybody in this room, with people who raise their hands, and the people who did not raise their hands, they have different hearts, different anatomy, and different structure of our lives, and you know, so much risk factors and comorbidities that define us where we are today. And these changes happen in hearts. So I wanna talk about this, how we're predicting treatment outcomes, not only in AFib ablation, but which is, Sanjeev just shared with me that the latest number is 150,000 people ablated in America every year. By the way, 10% ablated by Andrea in Austin. <laughs> and uh, the, the rest in the rest of the, of, in the United States. But anyway, it's, it's 150,000 people out of six, seven million AFibers. And I think if you look more into the hearts, we start defining, convincing you, I think you ablated earlier than later based on the structure and the tissue changes. I, I think this could be half a million, a million people that we can help early on in the disease progression. I want to show you some data and how we're using as treatment target, and this is in the process, hopefully being standardized. So this is a way we do this, uh, and this is a paper published last year. This is the point. So you see this from the screen, I have no mouse here, but uh, that we do an MRI scan. And by the way, this is 10 years ago, was, was only in Utah now. Uh, just ask for it, uh, Siemens and Philips and GE can offer this. But this is an MRI scan that you go the specific way to look at the atrial wall, the thin atrial wall seen here. And we define how much damage we have. So the summary is seen in this slide. So green and whitish is, is 
uh, low gadolinium or uh, uh, cleaning up or flow, and that means more diseased tissue, the blue is, is, is healthy tissue. And uh, so this is how we detected using that sequence, and if you want to look at further, this is a paper published. Actually, there's 28 paper published describing this way from other labs as well. So this is the next slide. So this is an important paper. One of the most important papers actually published from, from our lab describing this, because this correlated the open heart surgery findings to the screens. So these are tissue from patient underwent uh, either mitral valve surgery or bypass surgery, whatever it is, and then we took uh, biopsies from these areas to correlate the findings to what we see on MR. And you see this is a control no AFib patient, and this is a patient with atrial fibrillation. So this is a slide, uh, the paper published by McGann uh, two years ago, where they're showing that this is what we see is really changes, which is fibrotic. The more green, the more dense the fibrosis, the more dense the changes in your heart, and the less green, the less changes are there. As you've seen in here, for example, less, and this is a healthy area where there's no fibrosis. So this is, uh, again, this is one of the most important paper we published because we correlated this finding before we were relying this on outcomes and see what they means based on outcome of the patients, but now we have histological correlation. And this is, a, this is an important slide. This is a collection of patients from our, actually the DCAF study that has been published, as I think part of the study is presented as well, not only in, in JAMA, but recently showing this different variation. But these are different patients with AFib. And it's two I always try to highlight. This one here, which is an 82-year-old old man uh, who's skiing Utah, had AFib for two years, and because of his age, he was 10 around, and he's not close to Austin to be updated, because Natalia's not there. So they're giving him amiodarone for two years, because he's old, and give him blood thinners. And, but this guy have a little amount of, you know, has been AFib for two years, stopped skiing because he's scared of, attain, I mean, taking Kumid, and he could not ski, so, but we updated this guy because of little changes. And this is a 51-year-old woman who running marathons and came with AFib. I'm not saying this lady is, should not be ablated, or, but, but look how much damage she have in her heart already. And this is a, a lot of fibrosis. And the reason why MRI works in this patient, and this is very important, because the patient with AFib, they have this patchy pattern of changes. So, so this scar is patches. You see that on the, on the slide. This, it's not, rarely you see like the whole heart is diffused or, or fibrotic. There's always area left behind, and that's why this MRI works because the, the gadolinium slows down certain areas and washes out other areas. That's why it's easier to see using MR. But anyway, this is the pattern you have to think about when, you, when, you have, when you're dealing with an AFib patient. And as well with non-AFib people, because we have a study now coming out showing even people without atrial fibrillation have scarring. And what that means, we have to wait and see what, what that will mean long term. But this is a trying to share with you briefly how we image this and how the hearts of the AFib patient look like in fibrotic tissue. This is by way, the, the amount of fibrosis has been, people with persistent AFib have more changes, but still people with early changes, half of them have persistent, half of them paroxysmal AFib, and this has been shown a couple of times already. The next I want to talk about how, how we look at this and predicting treatment. Okay, uh, the amount of fibrosis, I, I think we showed this from intercardial mapping from Andrea, where we did the, a CARTER map and predicted outcome based on amount of scarring when we go into the heart, but how can we do this before we go into the heart, predict outcome of the ablation uh, using different, uh, uh, I'm still confused with this one right here. This. So we did, this is a, a, couple of slide, a couple of papers presented from our lab looking at this, but this is the DCAF study where it's a multicenter, and we looked at patients based on four stages, and people have little changes in their heart and people have more changes and more and more, so 10, 20 percent, 30 percent and more of fibrotic changes. And we, and we try to understand how this predict the outcome of the AFib ablation. Based, majority of patients had PVI, 70 percent of these patients, 73 percent of these patients with paroxysmal AFib. And the, and the outcome of the study is shown here that the more scarring you have, the less the chance of staying in sinus. We call it the stage four, or the stage four. The less fibrosis you have, the better chance to stay in sinus, and this is looking at persistent and paroxysmal, you can see the curve have four stages as well in both groups, although UTA4 and UTA1 widespread, the rest is in the middle. So we learned that the more fibrosis, this is what we confirmed in DCAF, we're trying to do another study, I'll share it with you there later, but fibrosis before ablation, it's been known for years, the more scarring, the more damage, the worse the outcome. So what's the solution? 
just have to wait to see. Andrea said the non pulmonary vein triggers, pulmonary vein, uh, the appendage isolation could be a solution for these patients. You know, do something about the AV not I don't know, but these patients sim seems to be a struggle for a lot of people, and maybe should looking more and more about. Uh, I showed some slide about rotors and mapping these patients and uh, all non pulmonary triggers. But keep in mind, the more fibrosis you have, the chance of being successful today is is less. And this is data from our lab for six years follow up using this approach, this, this, this fibrosis predictive value with a, with a single ablation procedure. And you can see Utah 4 or stage 4, the success rate is only 8, 9% at, after six years or five years follow up. Uh, that's continued the curve to, to, to spread. Everybody recur, as you can tell, but the recurrence rate in the early stage is not as much as the later stage of disease, uh, as you can tell from this slide. So how, how, how we apply this during treatment, and then we learned a lot. We learned a lot from DCAF. I mean, we've been doing this ourselves and looking at our data, but DCAF taught us a lot because DCAF study is multi-center. As, as I showed you, there was the 15 centers involved from the, lab, from the world. You show from this world map, there's very experienced ablation centers involved in DCAF. And what we looked at, we did not only blind the operator to the type of fibrosis image, before the ablation. So they will go and do the ablation the way they do it. Is it, you know, whatever it's done. Is it done in Bordeaux, or done in Philadelphia, or done in, uh, in Chicago? They will do the ablation the way they want to do it. And they follow the patient. And then we looked at three months after the ablation. If you had an ablation, we took you back to the lab and looked at the MRI scan uh, to see this red stuff. The red stuff are the, sorry, the red stuff are the lesions, the ablation lesions. So nobody can tell us in that ablation where the ablation was done. You can tell here, this patient have a lot of posterior wall ablation, as you can tell the antrimization. Andrea talked about the posterior wall debulking and have isolation around the vein, you can tell from here. So, so we looked at these patients. We had a series of patients, and we analyzed those, what the, what the lesions mean. Now, keep in mind, we did not put the catheter to confirm at three months the patient was isolated or not, but the operators try to do isolation with everybody. And this is a paper, by the way, just published recently in JC as well. So if you look, this is, this is a collection of patients from this experience lab in the world. And these are lesions. So I'm showing you how the people ablated. And I have to, uh, I have to confess, though, Andrea Natal is not part of this, so they don't see all the lesions there. So, so see, see, see this here. This is the stunning, struggling for us is most of the patient doesn't have lesion in the posterior wall. I mean, the antrum is isolated around the veins. By the way, this is a cryoablation uh, patient. This is a cryoablation patient. And this is a cryoablation patient. This one and this one. And you can see the lesion. So let's keep in mind, I mean, Rob talks about this, great hands. If you have a cryoablation, you have to have great hands operator because the lesion otherwise way inside the vein. So you have to adjust them to be outside. Maybe the new balloons would be better. But you can tell. And But the right side, this is looking at the, at the atrium from the back. We're standing beyond behind your back and looking forward. So you see the right side, the right antrum, there's almost no lesions there in most of the patients. You see that? That's interesting. But again, so all these guys try to isolate the veins in these patients. Keep in mind, as I said before, 73% of these patients are proximal AFib. And if you look at how many of these patients, and I think uh, Rob showed the same data in his, his chart, it's so only 7% only of these patients 6.7% have all veins in circuit with ablation lesion that's shown this slide. So again, this is, the operator never knew that they, they did the ablation with the, with the CARTO or ESI points or the balloon and, and they were sure they isolated the veins and, and that's what we expect them to do. But the key is that only 7% of the people who underwent a PVI had the encircling lesion on the veins. Uh, but what we found in this study, what was interesting for us, is that something called the residual amount of substrate of fibrosis left behind, okay? So what I'm showing you, I'm showing you what we saw in the study. Now, what that means physiologically, this is the next stage. I'll, I'll show you some more data, but this is what the study showed us. The best predictive of outcome in, in DCAF is, is how much of this fibrosis disease early on. So we took the disease tissue, and we superimposed in three months. We, we told the operator, where did you ablate? We looked at the MRI and we put this lesion on top of the disease tissue, which is the green. And we looked at the, subst uh, the residual star. See, the residual area of disease that initially was there. And that was the most powerful predictor for outcome in, in decaf. So the more ablation you do, you can say, okay, 
if I do the appendage, like Andrea showed us, and I do the posterior wall, so I'm covering more of this area, and you can say now there's, I'm covering more triggers with this. Physiology, again, all rotors, as, as Sajib will show you. The bottom line is the more you leave the veins and ablate outside, the better the outcome, that's what we learned. And as important, the more you leave those, the worse the outcome. So we learned that you have to cover this tissue for whatever reason, what you believe for, that's important. So what, what we recently learned, what this is very important for everybody in the room, except and, 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 and then for us as operator, is the progression of this fibrosis, what that means. And there's multiple reasons why this happened, right? So some of you will have AFib, and AFib begets AFib, and AFib gets worse, electrical remodeling, but what about the tissue changes with time? And we learned a lot from this here uh, using multiple MRIs in our patient when we follow them. And this is very exciting for us. Uh, so, so this is the, the, we're looking at multiple MRIs. You see in this side of the screen here, you see first, second, first plus second residual. You can look at the software and add the MRIs of this patient over the years in CNAS. What I'm showing you here is this is a patient who had an ablation three months later. This is a lesion or six months later. And you start scanning them like 18 months. You can choose the timing here, 18 months or 12 months, whatever. And you start seeing new green stuff coming up in some patients. And this is summarized in the next slide. So this patient had an 11 months MRI showing the lesions, the same as before. And in 23 months, this little green came in addition to the, the old MRI scan. So this patient is doing well. These are patients patient that have no progression of fibrosis, stable, doing fantastic no recurrence. You usually see this a lot. The patient are worrisome to us and seem to be a problem are the people like this, where you have the MRI, you see the lesion, but they come with recurrence. Well, the reason I'm showing you this, now we're using this to assess you know, recurrent patient, what to target. And obviously, we have to start looking outside the box as well. But key here is that this patient have new areas here. And he had an AFib recurrence here, 25 months later, not 18 months later. But you can see the amount of new fibrotic tissue that wasn't there before. So we have to factor this in when we take the patient back to the lab and understand what that means. Again, non promovent triggers, rotors, something else are going on, we have, or maybe the appendage ablation, I don't know, but what I'm showing you, how is the tissue behaving in these patients when we follow them? Okay, this is tissue changes. And this is another example with a, with a guy who, three months post ablation, uh, you can see the lesions here, and six months later have additional 7% of fibrotic tissue with 10% in new areas outside the lesion set, and seems, this seems to be a problem. And you can see this from next slide, when we looked at three patterns of changes in the heart in the AFib patient population after we ablate the heart. One is, one is the patient that, you know, have a new, uh, you see the ablation scar always recovery. There's some recovery in ablation scar three months versus long time. The heart rebuilds itself. But some people build the new fibrotic changes in green. Some people have a progression of fibrosis, like you've seen on, the, on, the, on, the, on this one here. The mouse is not working as the uh, pointer. On, on the progression side, and one is recovery, which is uh, the recovery ones, you see that there's no new fibrosis and the lesions recover, but the upper two, whatever you have new green bars, new fibrosis, uh, it's, it seems to be a challenge going forward. So we're doing a, a big study looking at that factor in recurrent patient now as, as, as we speak. And very important for you, you know, atrial fibrillation have a lot of problems and not only quality of life, you know, stroke and so on, but the, but the ventricle is a part of the process, which all of us worry about in terms of every dysfunction, not every dysfunction. But what we're realizing when we're looking at the MRI, as an MRI is, I call it an open heart surgery with an open in the chest. I, I know that Ralph Demiano would be upset to say that, but uh, as we take the, the heart out and look at the tissue changes, and with the sequence we're using in Utah, we're looking at really 1.25 millimeter thickness. Uh, so we get a lot of details. And when we're realizing we're seeing these kind of patients, I mean, this is a study that's been sh shown already where, where correlating the bad ventricles, LV dysfunction with more fibrosis in the atrium. This is Dr. Akai published in JCE, which is kind of known factor. We know the AFib, LV dysfunction patient didn't do well, but this kind of explaining that the more disease. But, but what we're finding is these guys come to see us, they have no ventricular changes, have no ischemia, they have normal heart, and you see something like this, ex incidental lesions in the, in the ventricle. So this has been shown actually by a group in Boston that, that they predict, you know, uh, strokes. And we showed this as well. So we, we, we categorize the patient in this kind of patient. We see the atrium and the ventricle are 
it's local, called localized disease. We have nothing in the ventricle. Look at the fibrosis threshold, the adult thresholds, and there's no changes. Well perfused, beautiful ventricle, pumping well, no problem. And you see this kind of patients as well in this patient. Sorry, too fast. This kind of patient where you have lesions in the ventricle where nobody knew about. They have no serious ischemia, very good pump, but you see these changes on gadolinium enhancement. We call it incidental finding. So we start calling them the atrial and ventricular with diffuse myopathy versus atrial localized myopathy or atrial myopathy. And this is important. It's not only showed the incidental finding from other lab, but our lab showed also, uh, this is a paper coming actually in Jack Imaging that Dr. Wilson is, is publishing. And this is another example. Two people, normal view function, one have this kind of ventricle with AFib, one they have nothing. They have to mean something. The ventricle is involved in a way, and we have to take this seriously. We take, this is 9% of our population in Utah, 9% of the patient have this kind of finding. Again, no ischemia, no hissy heart attacks, no myopathies in the past. And this seems to be a predictive value for outcome. Uh, the ventricle seems to play a role. It seems to correlate to the eight, but it seems to play a role. We know, we have now the, M, the MACE data, the you know, multiple uh, cardiovascular risk factors data, we, uh, another paper coming out showing correlation as well. So now we're looking at obviously five, six years Look at Motede and others, and that's part of the DCAP2 study as well. Keep the ventricle of mind when you look at the MRI. So MRI fibrosis is not only in atrium, it's everywhere in the heart. And last but not least, how this became a target, and, and that's a slide that uh, all of us in EP, uh, a lot of you know more than AFib and EP by now because you go through stages to get to, uh, to AFib. You got to flutters, you got SVTs and so on. But we in EP, on all these you know, arrhythmia, as I'm showing this slide, our success rate uh, to, to ablate this, any lab in the world, any lab you go over, they report 98% or more success rate. Even VT ablation, to terminate VT, we know exactly where the, out, we, we map the VT, we know what the scar border is. It's all based on anatomy and electricity together. So you see the AVNRT, we know the area to go to, flutter, typical flutter, we know the area to go to, accessory pathway, we know the area to go to. And this is a VT. And we know there's a scar in the ventricle. We map the border of the scar, and we try to ablate this. And there's data coming from actually Andrea's lab showing that you have to encircle the scar from outside, inside to have a better outcome. So you go after the scar, don't only map the VT. So EP and anatomy comes together. You always have a success, a good success. And this is Natalia showed this. Andrea showed this slide. This is our most famous slide from Cleveland, I think. Like, he's still showing this 15 years later, by the way. And me too. I'm honored to be the first author of the paper, too. But Andrea, when we put, this is, this is, I'm not sure, and Andrea remembers the numbers there. It's in we published 92% success rate. We followed the patient for two weeks in that paper. And when we presented this paper, American Heart, everybody said, are you kidding me? I said, this is the real data. So we were ablating here, and this is what, when we saw patients are coming back, and six weeks later, eight weeks later, in Cleveland, the, 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 the blanking period, well, by the way, by the find, I'm not sure people remember that, but in Cleveland we defined the blanking period because we realized you have to wait three months before you know. And what we realized, yes, the success rate was 95% or 93% per system per system because we're doing one component of the AFib ablation. And this was with us the PVI, and then people will come back. And this is the example, and that's, uh, Brings me to the next slide, which is Andrea showed some of the rotors and concept. And, and this is uh, from uh, Michel Hasegera's uh, Pierre Jais slide. He gave it to me. Uh, correlating the, this is the Utah fibrosis uh, mapping here. And this is here, the rotors. And he's showing that these more and more, they seem to anchor on the site of fibrosis. So his anatomy and fibrosis coming together. And again, this could be non-triggers that Andrea is talking about coming from here, from somewhere else, some, some other people seeing as rotas, and Jeev will talk about this in details. What I'm trying to say, this substrate should mean something. How to use it, that's the question. And this is another slide, as you see, Andrea should supposed to be a movie, but it's now working, showing you all these rotors, the anchor on this fibrotic tissue. This is again from Pierre Jais. Um, the next, ah, oh, here, it is working. I shouldn't doubt Melanie Truholz. She's fantastic with media. So this is the next slide here. Uh, rotors fibrosis again. So I don't want to spend time on this. Sorry, this, this star should be here. This, they widened the slide move. But again, this is a slide from Mankoff for you doing the Topera system, which Sanjeev is going to talk about. And the same data has been presented by Dave Wilbur from Chicago. You're going to hear from him tomorrow. 
And he's looking at this fibrosis, and they're anchoring these uh, rotors on these areas around the fibrosis border. Uh, they're taking advantage of it. It seems like they make sense, and in, in, in actually, in these labs, they're using the Topera, which is Sanjeev's system. He's going to talk about it, or the other one. So this is the, the areas where the ablation has done in, in from Mankov, the one I showed you before. And you see they ablate these areas. They did some PVI on this patient. You can tell there's too much ablation inside the vein. But, but what I'm trying to say, this is lesion three months after. And if you keep the lesion in that area in his patient population, it seems to superimpose on the, in the he covers the fibrosis as well. The, the outcome seems to be promising. But again, it's, a, it's only three months full up data. So, so based on this, all this data, as it has been doing this since we presented DCAF1, is trying to encircle and do more ablations. We do, obviously, the pulmonary vein antrimization. We, we, we color our veins when the cartomab way wide, so we go way outside and try to do a lot of lesions here. We never do one single line, but we, we take this area seriously. We try to encircle that area and then cover it with lesions as well, as you see in this slide. And, and the residual fibrosis from decaf, this is the quartiles, the four quartiles, the amount of how much scarring you left behind seems to predict the outcome. So I have to go now to the next stage, how we can make this 100%, not only 36% success. So hopefully by covering more fibrosis, the outcome will be really better improving. We're trying to do this in a multicenter study as we speak. But uh, let me see if this is coming up. Yes, and this is a decaf 2 study, which we want to do is a re-prospective randomized looking at pulmonary vein isolation versus, versus uh, pres in, in present AFib patient versus covering the fibrosis or ablating it, like this one, versus doing fibrosis target ablation. Uh, and obviously, labs will be doing, probably uh, inducing uh, at the end of the procedure, see if there's non pulmonary vein triggers and other stuff. Uh, but that's about the simplified study, trying to understand in advanced stage of disease, does this really help? in a way, or seeing something else that we're missing. We go on to monitor the patients as uh, a continuous monitoring with the mobile devices, and then uh, it's a 12 months follow-up study looking for AFib, but looking at other stuff as well. So this is something we're doing as we speak. So in summary, I hope to convince you, complete the puzzle we started today with, you know, covering the balloons and Andrea's extensive experience. You see that we're still looking for answer, and I tried to convince you that the substrate, or at least specifically atrial fibrosis, there's a whole lecture on the ablation substrate that we initiate, and there's a whole lecture on the drugs effect as well. I can share with you another time, but it plays an important role, and, and, and you've seen this before, that that's a, that's a component we can neglect. We have to target, we have to keep it part of our procedure. And what we're doing here, we're trying to show it, hopefully to improve outcomes, and uh, I don't want to use the word avoid second ablation because it depends where you go. People want to go to second or third. It should be done in some patient, but at a certain point, we should say, you know, this is a difficult, hard to deal with. Um, and last but not least, I, I, I hope we can start using this. It may prove, maybe not, but at this point, the data from our labs and others has been showing that, and as Andrea said, prospective studies are important to prove the concept. That's why we're trying to implement this as a treatment target with a prospective study. But at this point, it's a, we can neglect the fibrosis in your heart. Take a look at it. What it means in terms of outcomes is clear data from endocardial mapping, from epicardial mapping, multiple labs already. And last but not least, physiologically seems to be an anchor for problems or maybe source for triggers because this tissue is not clean scar. It's, it's, it's dirt, we call it dirty scar, inhomogeneous scar. Uh, that's different than the ablation scar. So keep this in mind leaving this room today. Thank you. So let me see if I can get this to go. Please have a look at my disclosures. So um, I usually start off by saying that there's a lot we don't understand in AF. So we have to start off by looking at what we think we do understand. And so I usually start off with my St. Louis slide, which I put in particular because Dr. Damiano is in the audience. For those of you who've been to, to Missouri, where I did my training, Missouri is the show me state. Um, so named because in 1899, Congressman Willard B Duncan Vandiver said, I come from a state that raises corn and cockleburs and Democrats, and frothy eloquence neither convinces nor satisfies me. I am from Missouri. You've got to show me. So for those of you who don't know, that's a cockleburr. <laughs> and that's a Democrat. <laughs> so am I allowed to show this slide in Texas? I thought so. It doesn't go down so well in Boston. So, <laughs> so I'm going to talk about five basic topics. 
What's ablation? Why do more than PVI? And Andrea discussed this in detail. A real case of a difficult to treat patient with AFib who we really got started with this thing we call firm ablation, FIRM, which I'm going to discuss next, which is identifying little spots, hot spots, in the atria, which we think drive the chaos. Then we'll wrap up by talking pretty briefly about the results, um, which are still relatively early, although promising, and now I think probably in the order of six, 700 patients published. Um, and if you include different techniques, probably that's more than maybe pushing a 1,000, um, including patients that will be presented at the Heart Rhythm Society. And I'd like to wrap up with an important topic that Melanie asked me to discuss. Am I a candidate? What sort of things do I need to think about if going for an AF ablation, and how do I choose um, follow-up and so on? So first of all, what's ablation? So I think this is well known to all of you, but basically this would be a slide of an ECG, and as uh, Nasir said, AF patients know an awful lot about the disease. It's great to see that, but let me, which way do I turn? Maybe this way. So you have a regular rhythm, which would be sinus rhythm, and over here you've got irregularity, which we call AFib. There are reasons we call it AFib and not something else, but it starts from this trigger beat, and so as Dr. Cole and Dr. Natali both said, these triggers are important, and what they end up doing is causing the rest of the AFib. So the approach, of course, has been to identify those triggers. They're often in the pulmonary veins, often outside. The standard of care is to ablate them near the veins. This figure's a bit wrong. Apologies, it's an older slide. But you don't ablate in the veins. You always ablate outside. Anyway, when you've done that, then you end up with your PVI procedure. The triggers in the veins can't get out of the veins. They can't trigger the AFib. You shouldn't have AFib. So does that work? So the real question is, we know that it works in many patients. Why doesn't it work in everyone? So this is the sort of slide you've seen before, that after one year, two years, the results are whatever they are, 50, 60, 70%. How can you do better? First of all, are these results shown in many studies? They are, so you can look at many studies showing that kind of figure, 50 to 70% at one procedure. The question is, many of you are in that, or some of you may be in that group where you've had a tremendous success after one procedure. What about other patients? Why aren't they in that group? How do we get a higher success? The one thing we, that we typically do is we are looking for those results we often hear, 70, 80%, the results that can be achieved. But the, re, the, the method of achieving them is often to do a second procedure or a third procedure. Is there a way? and we don't know yet as a community, is there a way that you could encompass some of the ablation we do in that second and third procedure and wrap it into the first? Now, maybe there isn't, because maybe every ablation lesion has a chance of eventually healing so that the AFib could come back. But maybe there is a way that if we targeted in a more accurate way, tailored to each individual person, we could increase that single procedure success rate and push it up. That would be the goal. And that's really what we've been focusing on in our group. Now, it's important to know that when we think AF has gone away, it sometimes hasn't. This is a patient I saw in San Diego a couple of years ago. He'd done very well after his ablation. He said, Doc, AF is gone. For two years, we got a series of ECGs, all showing no, no AFib recurrence. He had had a pacemaker put in for another reason. We sent him, he'd left my, my office and he was very happy. We were high-fiving, he went next door to get his, his pacemaker interrogated and lo and behold, we found that he was actually in AFib while he was telling uh, the nurse how great he was in sinus rhythm. So we know that we have to be very careful about declaring success, okay? So for all those reasons, how can we decide what to ablate to improve that success rate. So this is a figure which is complicated, but it just gives you a sense of what we can look at. This is from our society, the Heart Rhythm Society's main paper on what to do for AF ablation. And you've got the atria. This is the, the left one here on the left side of the panel. This is the right one here on the right side of the panel. And these are areas outside the pulmonary veins. As you know, the standard of care is to do pulmonary vein ablation. What else can you do? Well, one option is you can tackle these yellow blobs. The yellow blobs are nerves which are present in every patient, and some people have shown that they're important. So that's one option. Another option is 
you can identify spinning tops, which I'm going to show you we have tried to do and we've done, which might be important in some patients. We've shown them to be important in many groups, which may be in certain regions of the heart outside the veins. Okay. The third option is you could identify these focal hotspots, a bit like a spark or a trigger in the night sky, like a pulsar that's just firing. Can you identify those? The problem with this is there really are not many tools to find them. I showed you a figure of a catheter that we put inside the heart that's got really four electrodes on it. We often use two of those. So that's really what we've been using a lot to find where these hotspots are. Are there better tools to do this? Well, at the moment, we haven't found them exactly. And so what we often do is we try to cover the ones which we think are relevant, which can lead with a substantial amount of ablation. It may be necessary. There may be ways that we could cut down on that if we could find specifically what they are. So I'm going to show you a case of a patient where we did that and use that as a basis to try and understand AFib in more patients. So this is a real case of a chap, very difficult to treat AFib. This was a young man, um, I can say that because I'm older than him by far, 47 years of age, persistent AFib for many years, this is a few years ago, really had significant problems. He was actually pretty healthy, but was still going to the emergency room about every month to have electrical shock therapy, which can reset the heart into regular rhythm because otherwise he was getting short of breath and dizzy. This was really affecting his life, both his work and his family life and so on. He had a few other problems which were relatively minor. We will talk about those at the end. He had high blood pressure, which is very important to control, slightly high cholesterol and so on. Drank a little bit of alcohol, didn't smoke. So on examination, the details aren't important, but he was okay. Blood pressure was a smidgen too high. Uh, he was okay, a little bit overweight, not much. Okay, now he had already had some ablations. He'd had one ablation with a lot of lesions placed and it didn't work, unfortunately. This happens to everyone, including my group. We have patients like this. He'd had the second procedure, he'd had a third. And he came to me because someone had said, maybe what you need to have is a pacemaker and an ablation of the AV node, preventing the AFib from driving your heart quickly. So at 47, he wasn't keen, but that's what he'd resigned himself to do. So I said, hold on a minute, we've got a new approach. Do you want to be the first person, do you want to be that guinea pig who signs up under protocol to have this procedure? So he said, sure. The basic idea, <laughs> well, San Diego, they're a bit cookie out there, right? So the basic notion is you've got a tornado or a storm, what drives it? So our thought was maybe there's a source which drives this rhythm. So the source drives it, and you could have tons of complexity around there, but maybe there's a source. So we went ahead and used this new mapping system we had. We put it into his right atrium, where people don't normally ablate for AFib, and this is what we found. So this is what we call a rotational circuit or rotor. It's going around. From this angle, it's counterclockwise in the left panel, and you can see it here. So we found this. It, was not easy to do, actually. We did it, as I'll show you in a second, by putting a floppy basket catheter into the right atrium and doing computational analysis. And once we did that, we burned in that area in the right atrium, and the AF shut down. Now, this is my, one of my best patients. I typically show my best patients at talks like this. <laughs> um, but we've now had this in many other cases. So this was a case of a rotational circuit, a rotor, away from the pulmonary veins, where we ablated, AF shut down. We couldn't get AF back again. It was a tremendous case. In a way, it made sense because it had a lot of ablation already on the left. What could be left? Maybe it's in the right atrium. So this is another way of looking at that. I'll skip through this quickly. But basically, um, if you look at this kind of a map, you've got colors which go sequentially around, in this case, from blue through light blue, yellow to red, and so this the point is not working, but you get the idea. It's going around clockwise in that area. So that's what we did. We implanted a loop monitor to really show if he was having AFib or not. He wasn't. He, um, he stopped going to the emergency room, of course. He lost some weight, went back to work. He was very, very happy. So that was one great case. So 
how did we get this result? Where did we come up with this? Well, this is one of those examples where the truth was staring us in the face. It's like this quote from Mark Twain. When I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished to see how much the old man had learned in the next seven years. <laughs> so it was there all along. We just didn't always see it. So what was there to look at? Turns out that this is not our idea. This idea has been around for about 25 years. The idea that AF might be caused by a localized circuit, which is sending off chaos. Now, it was shown in animals. In fact, it wasn't shown in humans until recently. You've got, again, this circuit, which in this case is counterclockwise, going around. And on the periphery, there's these chaotic waves. They hadn't been shown in, in humans. Uh, but one analogy would be the eye of a storm. So in 2011, we first presented our data where we showed them in humans using this basket catheter I'm going to show you in a second with computer algorithms we developed to find this through the, the noise. And here you can see um, an activation which is white spinning around. Now, this is obviously one of those great cases that I'm showing you. It's an easy one. They're often much more difficult to see. I'm sure the, sure the panel could share that experience. We can discuss it. They're sometimes quite hard to find during a case, but this is a very clean example. Burning at those areas was effective, as I'm going to show you. How do we do firm? Well, I've already shown you the normal approach, and what we would do is that we'd go in with the catheter the same as usual, but we would use this floppy basket catheter, uh, which is very, very soft to actually record the signals from 64 electrodes. There are lots of systems. Other people are looking at other ways. There's a group in Germany. I just saw their results last week. Um, and they've got something like 256 electrodes in a much denser basket. But the idea is you can map everything at once. You don't have to move the catheter quickly, and you can get some idea. So I thought I'd show you this. So we'd start off. The, um, the patient would have to have AFib. So if there's an individual in whom we can't get AFib started, people who've got really minimal AFib, very early paroxysmal, I tend not to use this because you can't get AFib sustained. It's not going to work. We then put this basket into the right atrium. Don't worry about the details, but this is an x-ray view of that. We then get maps. We burn the rotor sites by moving the catheter within that, and we target those areas. Then we do the same in the left atrium, putting the basket into that one. Then we wrap up, and the standard approach is to do PVI. I thought it might be fun for you to see a video of what it looks like to have a catheter inside the heart. I found this one from a colleague at the University of Minnesota. So this is the inside of a saline-filled animal heart performed under protocol in Minnesota. So what you'll see is, this is the inside of the heart that's beating. This is the top chamber, and this is the, the area between the two top chambers. This is now the catheter that any one of us on the, the panel would put, pass up through the groin into the heart. We would find that very thin area that's translucent there, which is the intraatrial septum, the fossa ovalis, and then we'd poke a little hole from the right to the left. You'll see in a second with this thing crossing into the left. So this is it over on the left. And then when that's in, of course, this is normally filled with blood, but then you'd go and find the area. Finding the electrical patterns is the skill, art, difficulty, challenge, whatever you say. This is just another view of one of the valves in the heart. So that's what ablation is actually doing, and that's why this can be very, you need to be in the center, as Dr. Natali said, which does a lot, because there's a lot of ways to move that catheter, and you want it to move to the right area effectively. So here's another quick case. Does this result work for a long period of time? This is a, a gentleman, 61. He was active. Um, he had AFib for a long time. He had ablation at another center. AF came back. We did our, the study. Four um, rotors were found. So these are usually not one. There's usually three or four of them, rarely two, sometimes five or six. It really depends on how advanced the AF is. I just got an email from him actually just, uh, just before Christmas. And he's now, I did him an, when I was working uh, in Los Angeles. This was two years late, later, he's still in sinus, and he was very happy. So again, another great case. I'm typically showing you my great cases. How does this work in a large population? So these are the results that we've had. Um, and these are single procedure success. 
Um, and you can see that overall, on the left-hand panel was the original trial we had called CONFIRM, where the success rate of PV isolation alone in red is shown. And when you added this thing called FIRM, we increased the success rate relative to PVI alone. In a way, it's what N Dr. Natali said. PV ablation alone is often not enough. If you add something to it, what we added was the rotor ablation. In the right-hand panel, you can, see, um, you can see data from a group of investigators, including um, some members of the panel as well, not including our group, who showed without a control limb, but just looking at a group of patients, some of whom were quite sick, how well one ablation procedure does, and those are the results. Pretty similar between the top right top lines and the top left top lines. So uh, we'll sort of wrap up. Am I a candidate? Are there things we can do? Well, there are always things we can do before we have an ablation. One thing we can do is avoid this trend. So it's not that trend we need to avoid, it's that trend. According to my wife, women have a much easier job of that. So how can this be relevant to AFib? We now know, in fact, that it's very important to avoid and control risk factors. This is from a study from Australia that was recently published, showing on the left in the blue line that if you have an air fibrillation without taking, without paying attention to blood pressure, weight, and so on, the results are shown. Single procedure success at one year, 60%. If you paid particular attention to losing a bit of weight, maintaining blood pressure well controlled, and so on, you could raise your success by 10, 15, or 20 percent. And this is becoming a very important theme in our field. The AF ablation is not just a procedure, it's part of a management strategy. The left panel is one procedure success, blue is w without risk factor modification, red is with, and on the right is multi-procedure success, the same thing. So in both cases, making this part of an overall strategy was very effective. I'll just wrap up two slides. In preparation for any AF fibrillation, including firm, set expectations. It is unfortunately still very common you might need two procedures or sometimes more for an AF fibrillation. If you're getting ready to go somewhere else for an ablation to see Dr. Natali, for instance, or any one of us, get your records, MRI, CT. These are really effective and useful. One of the most important things here and what is what kind of blood thinning you will have, and that will be discussed with your group. It's important. And if you're planning to travel, plan a sufficient post-procedural stay, and then decide how follow it will be done. So there are some firm ablation trials which are ongoing by uh, many different groups. But at this point, I think I'll probably stop and ask if you have questions. To summarize by saying that beyond AF ablation, um, to improve outcomes beyond PV isolation, other ablation is often performed. One approach is to ablate these rotors, which have been shown by many groups now to be sustaining the chaos of AFib. There's typically a few per patient, often in, in the right, which I think is a very important area to ablate. In early studies, the results are looking good. And that's it. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Um, one thing I was curious about, we keep saying AFib. Uh, I, my understanding is flutters more right, fibs more left, and can all this be applied, flutter and fib, mixed? How do you, is there, are there differences? The, what to know, can you apply everything to flutter and the distinction between flutter and fib? Flutter, fib, fib. Yeah. Yes, so uh, actually they, they are uh, now mounting data that even typical flutter that uh, has this sole clinical manifestation is actually a precursor to a fib to the point that uh, uh, there are now probably three randomized studies in patients presented with flutter showing that if you do the PVI, uh, you have higher uh, chances of keeping these people free of HL arrhythmia follow-up. So even flutter is a mas manifestation of triggers uh, from uh, the pulmonary vein. I think it's a, a sort of a, a stage of the disease where the, the fib bursts are short and you don't document them, and you see the flutter as the result of the short burst. And then if you wait long enough, uh, uh, depending on the different patient, eventually if you become a, a, a sort of a independent clinical uh, disease. We also have a study of patients that have ablation where the recurrence was a flutter, not around the vein, it had potential sources, but you know, for example, perimetral flutter or isthmus flutter, where ablating the flutter only it doesn't really fix the problem. You need to kind of find the source of that flutter. So there is a, relation, a, a, a relationship between uh, 
uh, triggers, and, uh, you know, which means fib and flutter as well. So, so a little follow on. I've heard recommendations for um, doing a right-sided procedure and then coming back and doing, if needed, a penetration and left-sided. Yeah, so you? you know, consider this randomized study, they are, they, they are coming out now. You know, actually our, I think it's just been accepted that there are two others from Europe. Right now, you kind of have to go with the clinical manifestation. So if you have flatter only documented, you do the right side, but you, you, you sh people should discuss with the patient, you know, this is not the end of, of, of your story, you know, where you're gonna come back, you know, anywhere between uh, one year to five, six years, and we're gonna have to do, you know, the I think once these three papers are sort of digested, I think, you know, especially in uh, younger people, uh, probably that will become a more accepted strategy, especially as it uh, become clear that uh, just the standard pulmonary vein is a very low risk of complication, uh, and so it, it doesn't really increase the risk of the procedure if you do that uh, uh, as a first-line approach. Right now, I think we people, we go by whatever is documented clinically. And I, I think one of the dilemmas you have, and just to, for, for the crowd, atrial flutter, if you've never had a procedure before, 95% of the time is a very organized short circuit around the right valve that divides the right atrium from the right ventricle called, called the tricuspid valve. Um, and it can coexist, not at the same time, but with patients who have atrial fibrillation as well. The problem is many of the drugs you use to treat atrial fibrillation make atrial flutter a more persistent problem. So atrial flutter is, is almost always a, a managed by ablation, which is very high success rate. And then you have to kind of talk about the pros and cons of doing an afibrillation at the same time or doing it staged. Um, I think you'd probably get a different answer five years ago than you get now because of people's experience, uh, I'd venture to say. Okay. First of all, excuse my ignorance as far as fibrosis. Um, is the fibrosis, <coughs> excuse me, already there because of old age and is it exacerbated by the lesion and has stem cell research ever been considered for reparation in that area? That's yours. Good question. Well, probably, and Asir should be uh, the one answering this, is that it, what, the, what the Torbolu show you is uh, a progression that is independent from the lesion. Actually, what the point that he made is that the, the good uh, ablation lesion uh, is what you need. Uh, the, the, the fibrosis that you show is something that kind of extends beyond the location of the lesion, mm -hmm. and it's just a sign of a progressive disease that some of these patients have. Uh, so it's independent. Okay. And the other thing, the other sort of uh, message is that the people where there is a progression of the disease are people that might experience a recurrence, uh, uh, even beyond the fact that the pulmonary vein are properly isolated, just because the disease progresses and there are other triggers that sh you know show up at different sites. Okay. Is that correct? And the yeah. stem cell. Stem cell treatment. That's that's great. Another, another if we subject. Can, another if we, person. If we can get there, it's, it's uh, we need to find a way. I mean, that's all the studies we're trying to do now. Is is uh, the good news here is that we can see this from outside. Mm -hmm. At least we can predict it from outside. And now we have to figure out ways how to stop it from progressing, and who's the patient progress versus the other who doesn't, and what does it mean long term, and beyond just sub stopping AFib mm -hmm. in terms of outcomes, in terms of mortality and stroke risk. There's a, there's a data showing that the fibrosis itself, uh, we presented this, uh, not us, uh, some people from Europe presented this in ACC just a couple weeks ago, that the fibrosis seems to predict uh, cryptogenic strokes as well. Mm -hmm which is a disease atria. So, so it's, it seems to be more an independent factor, but that's why we need to come with ideas, how can we reverse that? Coming back to the initial part of the questions, age is a predictor, mm -hmm. yes. Um, hypertension seems to play a role, obviously. We have a lot of risk factors, and Sanjeev put the list together. So uh, we're trying to understand now does, does uh, what uh, Prash Sanders showed in, in his model, animal model, that if you do a risk modification actually not the humans actually as well, is, is you modify the risk factors, you can lower the, the, the AFib burden in his patient. So we're trying to understand, does it affect fibrosis as well? He's saying yes, uh, does it reverse fibrosis? But we think that if the scar is there, as showed the biopsy, it's very hard to reverse it, so we need to come with new ideas.
stem cell, we have to wait for this to work in the ventricle first before we go to the atrium, but there's a lot of ideas can be triggered. But, but the good news now, we can at least see it and, and, and monitor it. Thank you very much. You, I just add yeah. one point, and, and um, it's not inevitable that fibrosis is due to is goes with age. It's related, but there are data, the Platinum paper, that in fact it could be related to the amount of AFib, and so I think that's important. But you yeah. see it be when you have the MRI before you've even had the ablation, you will see it, will yes. you not? Yeah. You should, you should be able to. Yes. See it, but sure. it's not that it's inevitable in every person. Yeah. It, it's we controversial, but there are data yeah. to suggest it's we not actually, just going to happen. Yeah, we actually have some preliminary data that uh, uh, there are certain genetic, uh, you know, you can look at uh, genetic predisposition in different ways. There's something called SNP that uh, look at uh, uh, specific sequence, uh, and there are a specific sequence uh, that are more prevalent in patients with fibrosis. So it could be maybe genetic, uh, who knows, or it could be a genetic predisposition to the way the body reacts to a virus, for example. Uh, so that it's another area of, uh, uh, and there is some animal data with some agent uh, that uh, look at reversing fibrosis. I think that uh, Ali, uh, yeah. 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 so there stomach. are a lot of things that are going stomach. on uh, in, in, in this area to sort of uh, understand. I think we all agree fibrosis is bad. Mm -hmm. Uh, with Nasir study, you know, there is a, uh, a good way to find out, you know, because bef until then, we would find out about the scar when we do the procedure. Now there is an opportunity to do that, to find out that before, and they also give an opportunity to follow those patients because, you, you know, as Nasir is doing, you can reimage them and see, you know, if is this is something that, you know, is static or not. And, and as, as Nasir show you, in some patients it's not static and, and what that means for the patient. Mm. So Thank you very much, the, other, the other thing I'd say is not to be too much of a downer on stem cells, but yeah. the one area <laughs> in, in leukemia treatment where stem cells don't work is when the bone marrow is fibrosed. And so, um, so it, it's, it's a tough problem. Uh, also, you know, with stem cell, uh, where we are now is the inability to make those cells to talk to, to the existing myocardium. You know, we've seen this in... Uh, in model of uh, uh, heart attack where actually stem cell injection increase the risk of ventricular tachycardia because creates uh, create a more patchy uh, scar distribution uh, with now work function in cell. But the, what we cannot control yet still with stem cell is how to make those cell connect uh, properly with the existing cell. And this is something that we're not, we're not figured it out yet. Uh, yes, I've had two ablations. Uh, my last ablation was a uh, hybrid. I was under about 10 hours. And uh, it, it worked it pretty well. It's been a few years. Yeah, I was the first one. So. Uh, now, uh, he has been hesitating I've, uh, about uh, taking something other than Coumadin you know, for my uh, stroke risk. And he's saying that, that he didn't want to do that because there's no antidote for it. Yeah. So, so, you know, I, I, so, so I'll tell you, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad that uh, it worked. I think that, you know, what I said about the hybrid is that, uh, as you said, it's 10 hour procedure. And uh, when you look at the big picture, it doesn't change the success. So do the surgery, because it, 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 the surgery alone could have worked, mm -hmm. you know? So that's what I, what I meant. But say, said that with the, with, for the antidote. It's not really true that there is no antidote. There is no specific antidote, which has been, actually has been developed. There is a company, uh, actually in Oregon, that has actually already human data that uh, the antidote that they are developing w can reverse the effect of the new anticoagulants, the factor 10 specifically, in two minutes. Two minutes, 90% is completely abolished. Said that, uh, the reason why company cannot advertise about the antidote is because uh, they, to do that, they need to do, in, in US, uh, a study with the FDA. You know, it's the same things with uh, IFIB ablation. They cannot advertise about non-paroxysmal because the, the tool that we have are approved for for only for paroxysmal. So the same is true for that. There are actually studies showing that uh, um, uh, there are uh, uh, factors that we use. Uh, and the, 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 the most uh, popular one is called K-Centras or PCC, four factor. They actually reverse the effect 
of factor 10 uh, in about 20 minutes. Uh, the, the effect is not durable, uh, you know, lasts for several hours, but then you can re-administer, or by the time the effect of your uh, blood thinning, because of, of the short half-life is probably gone anyway. So they are reversal agent. What obviously what people worry about is uh, uh, a major trauma. In, in a major trauma, it doesn't matter if you are taking a new one or the, the Coumadin, because you're, it's, you're gonna be in trouble anyway. Uh, mortality on blood thinner with major trauma is very high, not because there are no reversal agents, just because things happen so quickly that uh, uh, it becomes difficult to uh, sort of control. So it's not true, entirely true, that there is no an antidote. There is no a specific antidote, and it's, be, it's being designed, but the, what we have is good enough. In fact, we do this procedure on uninterrupted uh, factor 10, and we would not do that if there was no antidote, there was no way to reverse the effect. I would add to that and say that I agree that there's a lot of um, fear about the new oral anticoagulants. Um, but in fact, if you look at many of the studies, then the, the risks of bleeding are the same or a bit less than on warfarin, Coumadin. And in fact, the risk of brain bleeds, which is the one thing that you could argue is the worst kind of bleed, is actually often lower on the, with the newer agents. So I would agree that particularly if there's no risk of trauma. Of course, it depends on each individual person. You should not be that worried about it. Oh, okay. Thank you. Go ahead. I was wondering uh, if you guys had any thoughts on the correlation between long-distance endurance female runners and atrial fibrillation. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> if you look at, so the, uh, there is this sort of this fear that uh, First of all, exercise is far more important. And, you know, and, and actually some of the data that has been shown about uh, lifestyle modification uh, speak to the opposite. Obviously, we're talking about extreme people that you know, are sort of uh, go to the extreme. Uh, there is this perception that uh, um, uh, increase the risk. And uh, when we look at that, and actually we look at that also in uh, uh, astronauts, because there was this perception, you know, those are people that have to be very fit. Actually, the prevalence overall is the same. What, what, it, what, what it changed is the time of manifestation. These people tend to have it earlier. So it, it, it just changed when this happened in your life, uh, probably, but doesn't change. And if you think about, you know, now we're every, uh, a lot of group are looking at genetic. If, if this is a genetic syndrome, it's gonna happen, you know, the di what is gonna make a difference is when it's gonna happen. And so, you know, are you gonna need uh, cardiac surgery? Are you, gonna, are you gonna have uh, an inflammatory disease? Are you gonna get older? But it's gonna happen, uh, the matter is when and why at that point of your life. And that could be what extreme uh, exercise can do. Might, might change the time on, the, on manifestation, but it's not gonna make a difference overall. So uh, let me add to this, this is from the, from the myopathy or fibrosis data. If you, if you look at uh, endurance exercise, everything is made in life in moderation. Everything we should do, but our body made this, I think, and everybody agrees, moderation. Don't eat too much and don't run too much as well. I mean, it's, it's, uh, so people, if we're looking at uh, a study we're doing in, in, in Utah called the LAFT study. So there's a lot of bikers and, and people do uh, skiing and outdoors in Utah. And we looking at amount of fibrosis without history of AFib. And if you do more than two or three hours a day of cardio exercise, you bring heart rate up, your risk of having more fibrosis is there. Now, but what that means long term, if you look at what Andrea is saying about the AFib patients, it's AFib is on top of this fibrosis, what that means later. There's enough data to show that AFib may happen in these guys, but it seems to us you know, from the data presented as well for these athletes. That's why we don't discourage people from doing exercise. Yeah. It's always great. Don't stop. Don't stop. But, you know, uh, I'm talking about people who do two, three hours a day, which is very rare unless you're a massive biker. And still, these guys, they don't seem to have a lot of problems with this AFib, even if it happens after life. So yes, they have a lot more fibrotic data, but what that means, we're still trying to understand what the effect. So don't stop exercising, please. You know, that's it the bottom line. As though when I was training twice a day, um, around six hours a day. It, it didn't bother me then, but later on in life it did. Okay, maybe this is uh, the, the AFib or the, the what did bother the you? The AFib. I was diagnosed in, in 2005, 2006. 
So earlier in my earlier days, when I was training hard twice a day, it it didn't it didn't bother me. But later on in life, it did. Yeah, this is a progression of the disease, obviously, exactly. from multiple you know the, the, the structural remodeling and everything associated with AFib, unfortunately. So, thank you for all our speakers, and hope you appreciated how complex a process this is.